simply tells us that we have to let it go. There's some times in life we simply have to let things go. Many times we think things are serious and they are really not that serious. We have to learn to let it go. We have to learn to let it go because nine times out of ten, we are just as guilty as the person who has wronged us. At one time or another, in this life, we have found ourselves contrary to God. When we talk about being contrary to God. There are what we have, what we call sins of omission and sins of commission. Sins of omission are lined out in James chapter 4 verse 17 where he says, anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. A sin of omission is a sin that is the result of not doing something God's word teaches us that we should do. A sin of commission is a sin when we take action that we take action to commit. Whether in thought, whether in word, or whether in deed. A sin of commission can be intentional or unintentional. Foreknowledge is not the issue. I'm trying to paint a picture here. See, if you visit a foreign country and they drive on the left lane of the road and you begin to drive on the right lane of the road, you are still at fault if you know the rule or if you don't know the rule. But not only have we done things that are contrary to God, we have done things that are contrary to one another. And many times when we find ourselves in the place where we have done wrong, we want forgiveness quickly. Not only do we want forgiveness quickly, we want to be restored to the place that we were in the person's life that we wronged. Amen. And many times, not only do we want to be restored to that place, but we want to be restored 
to a higher place. But sister Sue, we are reluctant. All right. To do the same thing for other folks. But when we look at the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf, he has forgiven us for a multitude of sins. But then we turn around and we're reluctant to forgive our brothers and our sisters over the little simple things that they do. We want to get them back. We want to be vindictive. We want to treat them differently. But we want God to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. One of the things I've heard in the church over the years is I forgive you, but I won't forget. Just think if God was that way. You finally make it to the pearly gates. And he said, Mosley, I forgave you, but I didn't forget. You can't come in here. We don't want the same treatment from God. We want him to wipe away all of our sins. But we don't want to forgive our brothers and our sisters over the simple things that have transpired in life. And the Bible does say that all have sinned. And have fallen short of the glory of God. Amen. But see, when Jesus instructed the disciples to pray like this, he knew that we would fall short of his glory. Amen. Even us who've been born again, fire baptized, Holy Ghost filled, sin each and every day. What does that mean, Pastor? That means that there's no big eyes. And there's no little U's in the church. But Jesus has instructed us to pray like this. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And when I begin to analyze this text, I realized that this word debt comes from the Greek word ophelima. And what this means is translated as a debt, but it refers to sin. But then when you look through the Bible a little bit more, there's another Greek term that is also translated sin, and it means missing the mark of God's standard of righteousness. Sometimes we miss the mark of God's standard of righteousness, but it's still sin. There's a term in the Greek that's translated trespass. And it means tripping and falling. This sin is, is, is described as tripping and falling because it's more rooted in carelessness. It is not and intentional disobedience, guess what, but it's still sin. There's another term that is translated, and it means that one has stepped over the line. When you step over the line, you've gone beyond the limits that God has set forth in his word. But when you step over the line, you do it intentionally. And it's still sin. There's another term translated from the Greek called lawlessness. It's more intentional and flagrant, and it is direct rebellion against God. But all of these are sin. And Matthew refers to all of them as a debt. It's a moral debt, and it's a spiritual debt. A white lie is a moral debt, a 
and the spiritual debt. Stealing is a moral debt and the spiritual debt. Hate is a moral debt and the spiritual debt. Immorality is a moral debt and the spiritual debt. Coveting somebody's stuff, coveting somebody's position, coveting somebody's place is a moral debt and the spiritual debt. Seeking revenge publicly or privately is a moral debt and a spiritual debt. But we thank God that there's power in the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Would you be free from the burden of sin? Yeah. Because there's power oh. in the blood. Yeah. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's time. There's wonderful power in the blood. Yes. See, there's power to change your circumstance. Yes. There's power to clean your life. There's power that'll make you walk right. There's power that'll make you talk right. There's power that'll change your circumstance. There's a power that'll bring you out. There's a power that will take you in. There's a power. Amen. There's wonderful power in the blood of the Lamb. But see, the reason it's a debt is because Jesus paid it off. It's a debt because Jesus paid the price. With that understood, what do we need to understand to receive God's pardon? Well, we got to understand that there's a problem. And the problem, Sister Shirley, is sin. Sin is what separates men and women from God. I want you to listen clearly. Because it separates us, Elder Harris, sin is our greatest enemy. Amen. Some folk think it's their brother and their sister. <laughs> but your greatest enemy is not other folk. Not the folk that don't agree with you. Or some of the folk that you don't like their ways. That's not your greatest enemy because your greatest enemy dwells within. Sin is our greatest enemy and our greatest problem. If we fought more against sin and not one another, we might have something going on here. Amen. Like preach Larry Mosley, I'm doing the best I can. But if we fought more against sin and less against one another, we might have something going here. We're too busy looking with that when we need to be looking within. And we are all guilty from the back door to the front door. Our greatest problem, if we are honest with ourselves, is sin. It dominates our mind and it dominates our inner man and inner woman. I would dare to say that that's our greatest struggle day in and day out. It is not other folks. Yes. Our biggest struggle is within ourselves. Yes. You have to understand that every man and every woman has been infected with the sickness called sin. Yes. That is our problem. But isn't it good to know? Because there's good news in the text that the Lord is with you. Yes. Yes. Isn't it good to know when you trust in the Lord? Yes. With all your heart. With all your heart. And you lean not to your own understanding. Yes. And in all your ways, you acknowledge Him. Yes. If you do those things, God will pardon you. I used to be a liar.
but you've been pardoned. I used to be a backstabber, but you've been pardoned. I used to be a thief, but I've been pardoned. I used to run the streets, but guess what? God pardoned me. I used to be a thug, but God pardoned me. I used to be vindictive, but I have received a pardon from one high. I don't know about you all today, but have you received a pardon from the king? The songwriter said, Jesus paid it all. Yeah. All to him I owe. Sin has left the crimson stain, but he washed it. Yes. You didn't take it to the dry cleaners, baby. He washed it. Sometimes we get it twisted, right? He washed it. He washed my crimson stain. White as snow. So this prayer is given to believers and the debt that is incurred by believers is the fact that we sin. We have to understand that our need for forgiveness outweighs our need for daily bread. But you've been pardoned. Tell your neighbor, I've been pardoned. You ought to say there was some spunk. Tell your other neighbor, say, I've been pardoned. So we have the problem. The problem is sin. But number two, think it was there the provision. If our biggest problem is sin, Mother Wright, our greatest need is forgiveness. All right. I'm let that sing in, let that marinate. If our greatest enemy is sin, our greatest problem is sin, our greatest need is forgiveness. But see, I understand this. This is where it gets tricky. We have been forgiven for the ultimate penalty of sin. But as Christians, as believers, as ambassadors for Christ, we need God's constant forgiveness for the sins we continue to commit. All right. As ambassadors of Christ, we have experienced God's forgiveness, which we receive the moment we receive Christ. We are no longer condemned. We are no longer under judgment. We are no longer destined to hell. However, because we fall into sin frequently, it requires God's gracious forgiveness. But see, check this out. I want you to listen to me closely. The forgiveness that we receive from God is not that of a judge. Amen. All right. Walk heavy, Doctor. <laughs> Somebody missed that. The forgiveness that we are asking for is not that of a judge, but that of a father. Somebody missed that. See, the judge has already set us free. The judge has already granted you the pardon. The judge has already given you the get out of jail free card. But you still continue to do wrong, so we need the forgiveness of a father. See, because the judge has pardoned you, mm -hmm. no one can condemn you. Mm -hmm. No one can bring charges against you. Preach, preach, preach. Because we are God's elect. John tells us in 1 John chapter 1, if we claim to be without sin. 
we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. But John keeps on talking. He said, if we confess our sins, then he would he's faithful. And just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. See, I want you to hear this. As a judge, God has forgiven sinners. As a judge, he's eager to forgive sinners. As a father, he's even more eager to keep forgiving his children. All right. See, I don't know about you who got kids. See, my kids don't always do right. We don't, I know y'all don't have that problem with y'all kids. But my kids don't always do right, says the servant. But guess what? When they don't do right, they steal my kids. That's right. That's right. When they don't do what I want them to do, they steal my kids. And I'm willing to forgive them because they are my kids. So if I'm willing to forgive my kids, our daddy is willing to forgive his kids. He's eager to forgive his children. Mm -hmm. So the problem is sin. Sister Sam. The provision is forgiveness. Number three, but there's a plea. The plea is the believer asking God for forgiveness. I think it was just not that simple. Sometimes we think it's just a simple thing. You know what? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. But see, asking God for, for forgiveness is activated by confession. Confession of sins is activated by your repentance of sins. Check this out. Feet can't be washed if Jesus don't, they don't get to Jesus. Somebody missed that. Your feet can't be washed if they never get to Jesus. Sin that is not confessed cannot be forgiven. And John makes this plain. He said, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Check this out, sister. So I want you to check this out. When we confess our sins, what I'm really saying is that, God, I agree with you. I am agreeing with you, God, that what I did was wicked. I am agreeing with you, God, that what I did was evil. I'm agreeing with you, God, what I did was defiling. I don't need to have any part of those things because I belong to the body of Christ. See, a true believer doesn't see God's promise to forgive as a license to sin. All right. All right. A true believer doesn't see God's promise to forgive as a way to abuse God's love. A true believer doesn't see God's promise to forgive as a way to abuse his grace. However, what we do see when we think about God's forgiveness, thinking it's glad is that it's a means to spiritual growth yes. and a means to sanctification. That means his forgiveness is leading me to look more and more like him day in and day out. My acknowledgement is causing me to change from the inside out. I am becoming more and more and more like Jesus. Glory. 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 And 
and we give God the praise, and we give God worship, and we give him the adoration because he is a forgiving God. The problem is sin. The provision is forgiveness. The plea is confession of sin rooted in repentance. Well, see, last but not least, this is the catch right here. There's a prerequisite. The prerequisite of your forgiveness is forgiving others. I'm going to let that sink in. It said, the prerequisite for receiving forgiveness is rooted in the words as we also have forgiven our debtors. See, we must forgive those Amen. who owe us a moral debt because we owe God a moral debt and a spiritual debt. Somebody missed that. If we want God to forgive our moral debt and our spiritual debt, we have to forgive others of their moral debt to us. Amen. It's very simple. If we forgive others, we will be forgiven. If we have not forgiven others, we will not be forgiven. We forgive because we want to have the character of righteousness. We forgive because we've been redeemed. Yes, all the price. We forgive, that's right, Doc, because we've been bought with a price. Yes. We forgive because we are part of the kingdom of God. We forgive. Because we are God's elect. Amen. We forgive because we are a chosen people. Yes. We forgive because we are a royal priesthood. Yes. We forgive because we are a part of a holy nation. We forgive because forgiveness regenerates the heart. We forgive because we are following Christ's example. We forgive because we reflect the character of God. We forgive because forgiveness benefits the body of Christ. When we forgive our brothers and our sisters, we can rejoice because I know that my God has forgiven me. I don't know about you, but I've had some good days. I've had some heels to climb. And I've had some weary days. And I've had some sleepless nights. But when I look around and I think things over, I won't complain because God's been good to me. I won't complain because He picked me up. I won't complain. Thank you.
Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. It's not that serious. So, so on this Labor Day weekend, what is it that we need to embrace to receive God's pardon? Number one, there's a problem. And that problem is sin. Number two, there is a provision. And it's called forgiveness. Number three, there's a plea. And it is, it is confession of sin rooted in repentance. And number four, there's a prerequisite. You got to forgive others. The songwriter says this. Blessed assurance. Yes. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation. Purchase of God. Born of the Spirit. Washed in His blood. Do I got some folks here that have been forgiven? Can you praise God? For being forgiven. He don't care what you did yesterday. You've been forgiven. He don't care what you used to walk like or what you used to talk like. You've been forgiven. Do I got some folks that want to give God the praise for his forgiveness? Do I got some folks that want to give God some praise for his grace? Do I got some folks that want to give God some praise for his mercy? Because they're coming out. It's coming out of the storm.